Well, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, my name is Tim Wirth. I'm president of the United Nations Foundation, and it's my privilege to uh, help to moderate uh, this very, very important panel. Uh, the topic today is, and let me read from the uh, agenda to remind us all, the UN Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen did not lead to a definitive global solution on carbon emissions. What immediate steps should governments, businesses, and civil society take towards a long-term climate path that is both environmentally effective and economically efficient? Uh, this session is part of an ongoing effort by the World Economic Forum to help improve international cooperation by surfacing the best ideas and triggering new practices in the governance of most important challenges. Davos should serve as a thread for feedback on ideas and proposals that the Global Agenda Councils are working at under the framework of redesign. As we talk about climate change, uh, let me divert for just a minute for those of you who may not watch this all in great detail and just give you a little bit of definition so that some of the words that may be or terms that may be unfamiliar uh, we can all share. Uh, first, the Framework Convention uh, is the Climate Treaty. It's called the Framework Convention. It was negotiated in Rio in 1992. And the operative words were to, quote, avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. Kyoto, which came five years after the Climate Convention was ratified by 180 some odd countries, uh, the United States was the sixth country to ratify the Basic Climate Treaty. Kyoto was the first implementation uh, protocol to the treaty. That was 1997. And it was at Kyoto that a distinction was developed between specifically what the responsibilities of developed countries were going to be, those were so-called Annex I countries, and what developing countries, everybody else should do, the so-called non-Annex I countries. Copenhagen was the third major convening that just occurred in December. Copenhagen's initial purpose was to design a treaty in which nations all around the world could come together in agreement about what a global strategy should be related to climate change. When you hear reference to COPs, it has nothing to do with policemen. It had, COP means the Conference of the Parties. The Conference of the Parties are all of the countries who ratified the Climate Treaty. They are members of the COP. What occurred in uh, Copenhagen was the 15th Conference of the Parties, the 15th year since the treaty was ratified in 1992. And Mexico will be the host of the next COP this year in 2010. So President Calderon has a very, very important function and what we're talking about today is the time between and what we do between COP15, uh, Copenhagen, and COP16, which will occur in Mexico. Final definition, the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, that is the scientific group that came together in the late 1980s, sponsored by the UN's World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program, more than 2,000 scientists from all over the world who have developed the consensus science upon which all of the climate negotiations have occurred. That's the IPCC. Uh, we're talking here about the way forward, and that clearly will be led by President Calderon. As we agreed this morning with his forbearance, we're going to spend a few minutes first on where we've been, uh, what happened in Co Copenhagen. Uh, if we did a cloud analysis of discussions at Davos this week, I think that no doubt Copenhagen would appear in very large, bold letters. While some have very, very strong views, most people are still trying to figure out exactly what did happen in Copenhagen and where we go to from here, our topic this morning. This is by no means clear, and there is by no means a consensus. Those with a very positive interpretation of, Co of Copenhagen will most often cite the fact that leaders in Copenhagen going into Copenhagen had to learn their brief. Nations developed consensus on the seriousness of this issue. It was the first international meeting based upon international consensus science. 
despite efforts of the climate doubters and deniers to undermine the science, and despite some unhappy and sloppy science and science writing, the evidence is incontrovertible that the globe is warming and that man is largely responsible. There was consensus on a target that we should shoot to have no higher than a two degree centigrade, centigrade increase or 450 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere and should move toward a low carbon economy by 2050. And the developed and developing worlds both made commitments, a breakthrough away from the stark line that had existed between Annex I, non-Annex I countries, developed countries, non-developed countries. That line had been very troublesome and is now beginning to uh, merge and change in some very interesting ways. Finally, out of Copenhagen, the developed countries agreed to a $10 billion package of assistance, moving to a $100 billion package by uh, the year 2050, 2020. Uh, those who, that's the positive view, and there are many positive elements of Copenhagen. The negative is that there was total chaos in the negotiations, and that venue uh, really reflects the lack of capacity of the UN to undertake such a negotiation, would say the critics. No agreement was reached. In fact, there are now greater divisions between North and South. Annex I and non-Annex I countries remain far apart. The urgency is much greater than the negotiations would suggest, and we have to now find a new venue and a new approach. So there's a very broad split and many, many shades of difference in between. Uh, to, sp to start the morning, uh, we've asked Ivo de Boer, the Executive Secretary of the Framework Convention on Climate Change, to set the scene as to what does he, from the perspective of the Conference of the Parties and the UN, believe was the result of Copenhagen? We've then asked uh, Sham Saram, the former uh, Foreign Secretary of India and now Special Envoy of the, of the Prime Minister, for the India perspective at what happened. Some very interesting and different negotiations occurred uh, in Copenhagen. And then Congressman Ed Markey. Uh, the co-author of the important Waxman-Markey legislation in the House, longtime member of the Congress, to respond from the perspective of the developed world as to what happened. After these short remarks, we will then turn it over to President Calderon, who has the responsibility for guiding us into the next year of these negotiations for a more lengthy discussion. We'll then ask uh, two industry people, Kyle Kuckwieser, Vice President of Deutsche Bank, Carlos Ghosn, the chairman and CEO of Renault and Nissan, both deeply involved with World Economic Forum activities to talk about their perspective on next steps, especially important since the private sector is now playing a larger and larger role, uh, was in my view practically invisible in Copenhagen, but now must be brought much more to the fore. We'll have the, then we'll have a discussion among ourselves back and forth. We'll save the final 20 minutes uh, for questions from the audience. So with that as an uh, introduction, Evo, do you want to kick us off? And over to you. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Kim, and good morning, everyone. Um, I, th I think I'd like to begin by talking about what, what Copenhagen wasn't. Uh, Copenhagen did not deliver agreement on a second target period under the Kyoto Protocol. Um, Kyoto, uh, Copenhagen did not deliver agreement on a new legally binding instrument under the Climate Change Convention. Copenhagen did not deliver legally binding targets for ind individual industrialized countries. But actually, it, it wasn't really supposed to do that. Uh, Copenhagen is, in a sense, a step on a, on a longer journey to come to that long-term response to climate change. You talked about 15 conferences of parties. M more important is, is what Copenhagen did deliver. And what Copenhagen did deliver um, is for me, first of all, an incredibly important political statement. Part of the chaos that we saw there was because 120 heads of state and government came to Copenhagen. 120 heads of state and government expressed their concern about this issue and the fact that they see it being at the heart of economic recovery, that they see it being part of an agenda in moving forward. The second thing that Copenhagen delivered was a core group of countries major industrialized countries, major developing nations, representatives of small island states, of African countries, 
brokering a political agreement which you just outlined, a political agreement which talks about maximizing temperature increase, providing $100 billion a year to developing nations. Specific pledges of $28 billion in short-term finance were made, but there was also in that political package an important political agreement on a financial architecture, on a technology agenda moving forward. The agreement also indicates that we will make reporting by countries more frequent, that actions will be reported on, will be monitored and verified, especially if there's international financial support. So basically, the architecture was put in, in place. What I see flowing from that architecture are commitments at the national level. Yesterday evening when I was in my hotel room, on my BlackBerry came in the commitment of the United States to a target in moving forward. China, India, Brazil, um, Mexico, uh, South Africa, Korea, uh, a host of nations around the world are moving forward to address the issue of climate change, the issue of energy prices, the issue of energy security in coherence. Countries are moving forward at the national level, whatever they felt about the outcome in Copenhagen. What we now need to do in moving forward towards Mexico is to ensure that we put an international architecture in place, a regulatory framework that allows countries to move forward on the basis of a level playing field, both politically and economically. So in that sense, um, Copenhagen will not have pleased the lawyers in the room, but I think that Copenhagen has given an important signal to the politicians and economists in the room. Great. Thank you, Ivo. Uh, in Copenhagen, a very important group came together, the so-called Basic Group, uh, Brazil, South Africa, India, and China. Sham Sarani, would you like to give us a perspective on what you thought came out of Copenhagen as, uh, and, the, and the Basic Group? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, let me uh, clarify that uh, as far as the uh, four major developing countries uh, that you mentioned, uh, they were very clear in their minds that they would like to see a comprehensive, balanced, and an equitable outcome from Copenhagen. Uh, that outcome was not achieved. And I believe that one of the reasons why Copenhagen did not live up to the expectations that the international community had was precisely because the question of climate change has become enmeshed with issues of economic interests, and I would say even issues of political interests. Uh, so it is extremely difficult to really focus attention on what all of us agree is one of the greatest global challenges that humanity faces. But in, when we start working towards meeting that challenge, uh, we get uh, bogged down in a lot of uh, issues of level playing field, of trade competitiveness, uh, issues when, which then make it very difficult for us to deliver the kind of collaborative response that we need to climate change. And I think the point that was being made by the major developing countries, not only the four basic countries, but the other uh, developing countries was that uh, really in this particular case, we need collaboration. And that is the spirit of collaboration which was missing. Uh, <clears throat> as far as we are concerned, what was good about uh, Copenhagen was that uh, the major developed countries, the major developing countries did come together. Uh, they did reach broad consensus, which is reflected in the Copenhagen Accord. And we think that it was uh, an important development in our journey towards uh, a global agreement. Uh, the fact that we reach broad consensus on some of the outstanding issues uh, leads us to believe that this could, in fact, become a very valuable input into the post-Copenhagen negotiating process, uh, which will lead up to Mexico City. And this is what the basic countries have, in fact, stated. Uh, I would disagree with the uh, notion that somehow or the uh, other, the UN system and the multilateral process failed. Uh, it is not the multilateral process which failed. Uh, even in other multilateral conferences, we have small groups of countries going into a side room, discussing various outstanding issues. But what is very important is that they always bring that back to the multilateral process. And I think the one of the reasons why Copenhagen did not deliver what it was supposed to deliver was because that particular link was missing. And I think we should be very careful that we don't trash the multilateral process when we take this process forward towards Mexico City. Great. John? Congressman Ed Markey? The, uh, 
I think what happened in Copenhagen from the perspective of the United States was that there was a very significant step forward. Uh, not as far as we wanted to go, but it has now put in place, uh, as Evo just pointed to, uh, the requirement that uh, all of the major players uh, have to make a commitment and put it in writing. And the United States yesterday um, put in writing their commitment to a 17% reduction uh, by uh, 2020 of greenhouse gases, uh, 42% by uh, 2030, and 83% uh, by 2050. Now, that's a huge uh, commitment. So we had an election uh, in Massachusetts uh, last week. Um, the politics in the United States slightly changed, but the problems did not. And President Obama, in his State of the Union address on Wednesday night, made it very clear uh, that he was fully committed to uh, passing uh, comprehensive energy and climate legislation this year. We have already completed that process in the House of Representatives. Uh, the Senate is now uh, considering it. Uh, but I think that if anyone had any doubts, uh, the president removed it on Wednesday night. Yesterday, the United States made their commitment to the world. And I think what happened uh, in Copenhagen with Secretary Clinton announcing the United States' intention to lead the effort to produce a $100 billion a year commitment to developing countries to help to finance deforestation uh, 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 protection, uh, prevention uh, efforts, adaptation efforts in developing countries, and transfer of new energy technologies to developing countries should remove all doubts uh, that the United States is prepared uh, to be a leader partnering with other countries uh, in the world. The planet uh, uh, has a fever. Uh, there are no emergency rooms for planets. Uh, we have to act together to put in place uh, the uh, preventative uh, measures uh, that will assure that we do not see the most catastrophic consequences uh, from, uh, from uh, catastrophic global warming. President Calderon, it's over to you. Most people think that there was directionally the right move uh, and all these avenues pour to your office and to Mexico for COP16 and the, at the end of this year. Thank you, sir. It would be a quite interesting COP in Mexico. All of you will be very welcome in Cancun at the end of this year. And probably one thing that we need to do is try to learn from our mistakes in Copenhagen and the previous part of that. One thing that we need to do is to reestablish trust and confidence between the parties. And in order to do so, uh, I want to hear all the voices. I want to bring to the table each and every country. And we need to understand that there are very different perceptions of the problem, very different economic, um, political interests, and I need to say legitim legitimate interest is not the same, the perception of the small state nations uh, who are in danger because they can, they can lose their territory is not the same visions of uh, developing countries without emissions than developing countries with emissions. It's not the same visions of developed countries. It's not the same visions in Europe and United States or Australia. So the idea is uh, to hear everyone. And I want to practice with, with actually the president, uh, still the prime minister, uh, Rasmussen, and other members, distinguished members of the international community, try to establish a method in which we can work all the year together. And of course, we will be very close to the United Nations. We will be in, in very close contact with the specialized groups, the working groups, uh, working uh, today in the different issues in post-Kyoto Protocol, working in the issues that are established in the COP. Of course, uh, in return, I will insist on good faith negotiations. I want to avoid wasting our time and going home after Cancun with empty hands. And in order to do so, we need to be very careful about the procedure. 
And the, the, one of the points that we need to establish is what exactly are the coincidences. Copenhagen provides us with a very good basis, if I understand, the goals about, related to the temperature, the commitment related to the funds, the green fund established there, and uh, very important things. My perception is that uh, the lack of consensus is related with the economic problems in each nation because there are economic costs associated with the task in order to tackle climate change. If we can find an economic mechanism with the right incentives in order to stimulate, in order to incentive actions coming either developed or developing countries, we will be on track to find what we want to find in Cancun, a robust, comprehensive, and substantial agreement at the COP16. It's not going to be easy. I think there are a lot of troubles with the traditional mechanism, negotiation by consensus, but we need to try that. Uh, before Copenhagen, we started to organize some virtual meetings between some members of the community. Each week, on Wednesday, several members, uh, Prime Minister Rasmussen, Prime Minister from Australia, others, uh, we have uh, meetings through internet. Maybe we can try to do exactly the same. We can try to, to get informal gathering through internet periodically in order to fix the problem and try to understand what are the main concerns coming from each country. We will do our best, but uh, let me be clear. I realize how important it is for the world to get a success in Cancun, how important it is to start take, taking actions today. Uh, for me, it's clear the scientific evidence is overwhelming. The effects of global warming are already affecting ordinary people, the life of ordinary people in developing and developed countries. Today, for instance, there are more than 2,000 tourists in Peru that are, they are trapped by flood, they are trapped by mood, and you can see it right now in Europe, the snow is uh, almost paralyzing the economic activity. And a few years ago in France, thousands of people Die do the the wave uh, the, the the wave that uh, of uh, high temperature that France suffered. So we need to act now, and Mexico has a clear commitment in order to achieve this comprehensive, robust, and substantial agreement in COP16. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, maybe the magic words that we uh, hear here is substantial agreement, and we'll come back and talk about you know, how we begin to define that. Uh, a central point that the President made was that we must start, start, we must start taking actions today. Carlos Ghosn, one of the key variables in climate change are emissions from transportation, and you've been at the center of the transformation of the industry, and maybe you could say, what, 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 when you hear the President say we have to start taking actions today, what does that say to you? Well, let me, let me talk about the Mexican commitment. Uh, Mexico was the first developing country in order to present the four communications to the United Nations related to our emissions. The first in developing countries to establish a unilateral, unconditional commitment in order to reduce 50 million tons a year starting in 2012. Uh, we are submitting to the... Uh, our commitment in order to reduce 30% our emission from business as usual by the year 2020 and 50% by the year 2050. And in Mexico, we are working preventing deforestation and uh, we are being very aggressive in terms of reforestation process. Actually, we used to, to lose like 300,000 uh, 300, hectares a year in the last decade and we are today we are preventing deforestation and reforesta reforestating more than 500,000 hectares a year. So we are compensating and we are reaching equilibrium in this particular arena. We are investing in technology in order to reduce our emissions, for instance, in oil industry. 
we are trying to transform transportation, we are trying to apply new mechanisms to, to, uh, to massive uh, ways of transportation in the cities. And my point is, of course, it's very expensive for us, in particular for Mexican economy. We suffer uh, a recession almost 7% negative last year, but nevertheless, we are keeping our commitment because it will be in benefit of the people. And I think that each single country could make similar commitment. What is the point? We need money for that. But the money will be there. I think it's a very good step in Copenhagen to talk about 100 billion a year starting 2020. And uh, the point is, how are we going to use that money? And one principle must be this, the result-based principle. We need to measure and we need to be absolutely transparent about our action. Point again to Carlos Cohn, who is, who is the chairman and CEO of Nissan uh, Renault. Yeah. Made major commitments in this area. Thank, thank you, Tim. You know, the first question is what do we need? What do we need from here? Uh, I think, I personally think that the results of Copenhagen are the best we could expect for in this time frame. And we are expecting a lot that in Mexico, what we need are targets. We need to move on. We need, as a private sector, we need to know exactly what is the level that we need to reach where in order for this problem to be behind us. So we need clear targets. Now, when we're talking about targets, is it 50% in 2050? Is it 60? Is it 70? Is it 80? And we need to stick to these targets. Now, after this, I think we need some encouragement and processes, like the President was mentioning, about favoring integrated approach. I mean, you cannot go to the car industry and say, okay, you're going to need to do this, and then go to another industry and say this, because from time to time, if in order to reduce the CO2 emission for cars, uh, the best solution would come from a good collaboration between the car industry and the oil industry and the chemical industry. So I would be asking for encouragement for an integrated approach. So nobody escapes is the responsibility, but we are sure that we are targeting the best solution, the solution that makes the most sense and require the least resources. When you push for integrated approach, you are pushing industry to have a good representation. You know, representation of the industry is today is a problem. We've been for the last three years at the level of the car industry working towards one common position for the car industry. We were not successful. We were not successful. We, I mean, recently, after three years of work, we came with one statement, which is going to be official today, signed by four CEOs, four CEOs of the car industry, because most of them did not want to sign, but these four CEOs represent a substantial part of the car industry. Okay? So if we don't push for an integrated approach, uh, you know, still uh, the public uh, you know, and the governments are going to have some difficulty to understand what the technology allows you to do. Because at the end of the day, most of these solutions are going to come from innovation and from technological solutions. And governments need to have some kind of objective image about what technology can allow you to do. Just to give an example, today we can do with batteries for cars things that five years ago were not possible. And probably we can project in the next five years to do with battery for car things that we cannot expect today. So somebody's going to have to be in a very objective way to explain what's possible, what is not, uh, what is not uh, possible. And on top, and the final thing I would like to mention is encouragement for private public collaboration. And I'm very glad to see that there is one specific example that is taking place with the electrification, you know, taking place in the United States, in Europe, or in Japan, where a government's and private sector are coming together to say, okay, uh, government cannot do it alone, private sector cannot do it alone, we're going to have to work together in order to make something that would make business sense and at the same time be very efficient for the public good. Great, thank you. That leads us uh, right into Kyle Kuckwieser. As uh, I think all of you know, uh, Mr. Kuckwieser has a long history in finance, public side with the World Bank, now uh, at Deutsche Bank. Uh, we have talked about these very large pools of capital that are going to be necessary for mitigation and adaptation in the climate area, promises made from the developed world to the developing world. Uh, this clearly cannot all come from the public sector. Kyle, give us your view. You've thought long and hard about the vehicles that may be necessary and possible. Well, Tim, first from a private sector perspective, I would call the results of Copenhagen a glass half full. We didn't have uh, very high expectations before. And uh, I think on the positive side, compared to Kyoto, 
all sectors are in now, very importantly forestry, uh, so to speak, the group of countries committed to serious mitigation action is now expanded. The basic countries are a very important element in that. And I think we have the outline, at least, of what could be a future financing mechanism, the 30 billion of fast start money, the 100 billion which comes out of work of Project Catalyst, others we have been involved with, which will be required for mitigation adaptation action, is in there. Obviously, the details to be worked out in a time where fiscal constraints are very large, and therefore the private sector through carbon markets in future will have to finance a lot of that. An immediate negative to add to the list is we have uncertainty now to the future of cap and trade and carbon markets, and even well-established carbon markets like the ETS in Europe have some doubts now on how this will go forward. So I think that uncertainty on the future of a carbon price and carbon markets should bother us as a near-term result. Now, where do we go from here? I think we need to create momentum, a three-pronged approach or even strategy. One is obviously the UN process and under the strong leadership of President Calderon. I hope there will be progress. It will be tough. It will be important to define milestones during the year. It will have to be run very differently. Let's be critical. I mean, there's a lot of lessons to learn. But I think a second prong in that strategy becomes very interesting. And that would be to have smaller groups of like-minded countries come together around certain sectors and issues and push the agenda forward. Red is a very good example how some countries took the lead. There's money on the table. There's payment for performance. There's transparency. I could see this happen in other sectors from a business point of view, perhaps in a tradable sector and in a non-tradable sector, uh, international transport, shipping, steel, some of the Japanese ideas on sector agreements come up again, power. And I think to, again, put serious money on the table, have on the recipient side credible performance and obviously all the MRV and uh, transparency related issues. Such flexible, variable architecture, smaller coalitions of countries, I think, can push that second prong forward, which could reinforce and maybe later lead back into the first prong, which is the UN uh, process. I would not even limit that to nation states. There is now evidence, even within the US, that subnational entities, states that are more advanced, California, in Brazil, Sao Paulo, Gujarat, could come together and form these small uh, coalitions to move on certain agenda items. Third prong, very quickly, obviously leadership from the private sector to identify this as a major opportunity, not a burden, opportunity for future growth, technological innovation, and uh, lead with big, iconic, mega projects. We are involved, Carlos, you are involved in many of these. We, Deutsche Bank, with other German companies, have started Desert Tech with the big ambition of bringing 15% of electricity requirements of Europe by 2050 from particularly concentrating solar power from the Sahara. These are truly transformational mega projects. The technology exists. The financing will be difficult, but it's doable. The geopolitics, of course, is complex. And then come to government as private sector around these new innovative projects and create the and ask governments for the framework conditions. And here comes the public-private partnerships. I think there's work underway that can lead to success, which would uh, scale up and leverage up limited amounts of public money. For example, through taking first-loss equity positions on, uh, on certain projects, that then on a factor of 5, 7, 10 leverages in private flows. Because the 100 billion, I believe, in the end, will have to come about a third from cap and trade and carbon markets, private to private, will come through schemes like this of leveraging up public-private, public monies, guarantees, the ADBs, the ADBs, World Banks, IFCs of this world could play a role. And of course, the fiscal coffers will also have to provide some. That would be my three-pronged strategy that is independent, these prongs, from each other, but mutually reinforcing in the end. Great. Thank you very much, Kyle. Uh, Ed Markey, we're beginning to get to a point of giving advice, I think, to President Calderon as to what uh, this, this animal is he's going to be uh, trying to harness uh, in the next year. Uh, what can he expect, do you think, from the United States of America? Well, first of all, President Calderon's going to do a fantastic job over the next year. So let's just start there. And he already outlined in his 
statement his complete identification of all of the big challenges ahead for him. And uh, so I, I don't think we really do have to worry about President Calderon. He is going to be a, a world leader uh, uh, over this next year. And, uh, and I think we can bring together a great um, uh, coalition. Uh, in the United States, um, again, President Obama uh, recommitted the United States to passing climate legislation this year. Uh, there is a coalition of Republican members led by Lindsey Graham and Susan Collins uh, who are partnering with John Kerry and uh, with Joe Lieberman in the United States Senate uh, working with the White House towards uh, finding a comprehensive agreement. Uh, the intention then is for uh, the House of Representatives, Henry Waxman and I, Nancy Pelosi, then to work with them in order to produce the legislation this year. Um, I believe that that will happen. I believe that that bill will be on the president's desk. Uh, and the reason I believe it is that it's in our national security interest. It's in our long-term economic interest. Uh, half of our trade deficit is importing oil, a lot of it from countries uh, that really uh, we should not be sending that capital to. So I think those imperatives are driving us towards um, resolving this issue in the United States. And I think since... Um, uh, Mexico is our closest neighbor, then working with them uh, to help to uh, produce uh, hemispheric uh, understandings uh, that can help then, I think, to uh, create a model for the rest of the world. Uh, there is no question, though, that uh, we will be successful. Uh, we don't have an option in the United States, and legislatively, I think Republicans and Democrats both understand that the world looks at us and they say most of that CO2 is red, white, and blue. Stop preaching temperance from a bar stool. Don't tell us what to do unless you have put your own laws on the books. And our intention is to do that. We will uh, complete that this year. And I think at the end of the day, go to um, Mexico as a leader, uh, partnering with President Calderon. Uh, in order to accomplish those goals. You might remind that if this does not happen uh, legislatively, the president has many authorities administratively, correct? If, if I may, yes. They, we had a very important um, Supreme Court decision, Massachusetts versus EPA, two years ago. Under that authority, the president and the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States now has the authority administratively at, at the uh, executive level, the presidential level, uh, to regulate greenhouse gases, to regulate CO2. So it's no longer a question of whether legislation passes or doesn't pass. If legislation does not pass, the president has the authority to regulate, even without legislation. If we pass legislation, it allows us to moderate the impacts on industries, on consumers, uh, to put in uh, different trade protections. But even in the absence of that, although it will be uh, a, uh, a, a less refined process, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States can regulate greenhouse gases, and the President and the EPA have already put in motion the process to uh, make that possible and to do so uh, in the course of this year unless we legislate. Sham Sharan, um, President Calderon laid out a very, very impressive list of things that Mexico was doing. Mexico is a non-Annex I country, does not have the same obligations uh, that developed countries do, but he has, as a rapidly developing country, put together this very, very impressive uh, list of commitments. Uh, the other, the basic countries coming in, what will they be able to offer to, you think, the... Uh, the goal of reaching, as the president has said, a substantial agreement uh, in Mexico. Will you be matching the kinds of commitments, do you think, that, uh, that Mexico has been making? Uh, Mr. Chairman, first of all, let me compliment uh, Excellency President of Mexico for the very uh, strong lead that he has given uh, in this uh, global effort to reach a successful outcome at Copenhagen. And uh, let me assure him, on behalf of India, and I'm sure this is the sentiment which is shared by his colleagues in the basic countries, uh, that we look forward to working very closely together with you to ensure that we have a successful uh, outcome. Um, let me uh, say that um, just as Mexico has uh, shown, the, shown, shown the way in taking on commitments which uh, it does not legally 
need to do. Uh, frankly speaking, most of the developing countries, major developing countries, are ahead of the curve. If you are looking for leadership with respect to what is required to be done, which is a strategic shift from our current reliance on fossil fuels to a pattern of growth which is based on renewable sources of energy, clean sources of energy, uh, these countries are way, way ahead. Uh, look at India. We have only recently adopted perhaps the most ambitious solar energy development plan in the world. We are looking at something like 20,000 megawatts of installed capacity of solar energy by uh, 2020 by 2022. Uh, we are looking at an increase in our energy efficiency by 2020 by a further 20%. We already have 22% of our land area under forest. We want to increase this finally to something like 33%. That's a huge carbon sink. And it is this which has given us the confidence to declare voluntarily that by the year 2020, we would be able to reduce the emission intensity of our GDP growth by something like 20 to 25 percent with, with 2005 as the base year. And if you look at the commitments which have been made by China, which have been made by South Africa, by Brazil, you will see that these four countries actually are already despite the fact that we do not have a global agreement, have already taken the lead. So there should be no doubt that these countries are going to work together with Mexico, with other countries, our partners in the United States, for example, uh, to make certain that the kind of collaborative, as I said, a collaborative response that is required uh, does come about. And I would like to just inform you that very recently, uh, the environment and climate ministers of the four basic countries met in New Delhi. And they agreed that they will work together, not only as a group themselves, but also with the G77 in China group, with our partners from the developed world, to try and ensure that there is a success to the process now at Mexico. We have suggested, in practical terms, we have suggested that we should from now to Mexico have at least five rounds of talks amongst the two working groups which have been set up, both on the Bali Action Plan as well as the Kyoto Protocol. Because we believe that if this is really an urgent and compelling problem, then we need to intensify our efforts to try and resolve that problem. So that is one important thing. And the second thing which I would like to mention is that the basic countries, despite the fact that they are developing countries, have also agreed to work together to help other developing countries in a spirit of South-South cooperation uh, to both meet the challenge of adaptation as well as mitigation. So this is the spirit in which we will, Mr. President, approach these negotiations. So if I'm President Calderon's staff, I'm taking notes here, Evo, and uh, I hear that the UN process works. Smaller groups of like-minded countries are coming together as in red. Sectors like the automobile industry are coming together. We've got a $100 billion package that is arriving and great uh, different kinds of financial models from the finance sector. The U.S.'s commitment to act, the basic countries have agreed to act, came together in New Delhi and agreed to act, sounds like a piece of cake. <laughs> why, why, Evo, is this so hard? Um, I, I, I think that President Calderon made it very clear why this is so hard. It's, it's so hard because different countries have very different interests in this process and because different uh, industries have very different interests in this process. Like any other process, this is a qu there will be winners and there will be losers, and the losers are very vocal in this process. So as President Calderon pointed out, what we need to do is to find uh, a balanced way forward. What we need to do is, as it were, make the cake bigger and make sure that we are offering solutions for different countries and different sectors of the economy. And that's why it's so important that we're not only talking about reducing emissions, but we're also talking about adapting to the impacts of climate change. We're also talking about addressing the issue of deforestation. We're also talking about mobilizing technology. We're also talking um, about mobilizing financial support for developing countries to try and create a scenario in which there will be maybe not something in it for everyone, but hopefully something in it um, for as many companies and countries as possible. And, and in that context, I want to say, if I may, Tim, something about finance. Yeah. 
um, because there's been a lot of talk about hundreds of, of, of billions. Um, I would like to be the last person in this room to create the impression that we are going to subsidize our way out of climate change and that we need to subsidize our way out of climate change. And let me give three reasons. First is that the IPCC, the scientific community, has been telling us for 15 years that we can reduce global emissions by 30% by taking action that will pay itself back through a lower electricity bill in three to five years. We're not doing it. The second thing is that I do not believe it is physically possible to continue to grow the Chinese economy at 8 9% per year using the current economic model. It just can't be done. And thirdly, I believe that Europe's target of a 20 to 30% reduction uh, of greenhouse gas emissions is not an environmental target. It's, it's an economic renovation target. It's an energy security target and it's an energy prices. So there is an economic agenda at the heart of this. And, and this takes me to a very important point that was made by, by Carlos. It, it's fine and it's important that countries set targets, but what is even more important is that we get to those private-public partnerships that will design the solutions that make sense from a business point of view rather than just throwing billions of dollars at climate change. Great. Well, Thank you, Ivo. Um, before we get to the promised questions, President Calderon, let me give you a chance to summarize what you think you've heard, what's been helpful, uh, and what are the biggest kinds of problems that you face in trying to organize this and lead us all into the sunrise in Cancun. Sunrise. <laughs> well, uh, first, uh, let me express my gratitude for the expression of representative of the Indian government. Uh, we have a strong collaboration in several fields. Actually, probably one thing that we need to do is talk a lot about this uh, uh, between all the parties, but especially uh, developing and largest countries, uh, because we need to build a bridge between poorest countries and developed countries, and we can do so. Actually. We we'll talk a little bit in our group, the G5, which is uh, Brazil, India, China, South Africa, and Mexico, and we can build uh, upon the efforts of uh, basic group and actually work together. We need to work together. So one very important point, Chairman, is uh, there is a willingness, and that's important. Second, there are several quite interesting proposals, technical and financial proposal, like the cap and trade proposal of Mr. Markey. Actually, let me suggest that you can change a little bit talking about not only cap and trade, American cap and trade, but North American cap and trade, because a lot of projects could be made in Mexico. For instance, we can establish uh, uh, as, uh, solar, solar facilities, energy uh, solar facilities in the border providing energy to the United States. It would be a very good business for Mexico, and it would be a way to match the commitments of several enterprises in the United States. And, uh, I think uh, there are huge possibilities for the success of your proposal if the Congress approve it. Uh, third, uh, there is the commitment in terms of financing, which is important. Probably it's not enough, but we need to start to work and work together. Fourth, there, I realized that there are very low expectations about Cancun, about COP16. And I do prefer low expectations. <laughs> no? So the, the worst enemy of any politicians and uh, head of the state is to have very high expectations. Uh, so I do prefer to work in this way. And finally, uh, we have an instrument, which is the Bali Action Plan. We have the instruments of the Kyoto Protocol itself the working groups, and of course the Copenhagen Agreement, which was not enough, uh, nobody uh, is satisfied with it, but it's a very important mechanism to move on. So we will be in contact in order to organize these kind of meetings during the years. I take the suggestions about the milestone, it's quite important for the success of the meeting. Um, finally, a special invitation for Nissan uh, if you are planning to build those batteries or even the electric vehicles, you will be very welcome in Mexico, whatever you need, in order to establish your plan. And there's a huge market in the, the region and the world, and we are 
very, well, we are leading the process of automotive industry. We are very competitive, so you can count on me for that process. Hmm? Well, Mr. President, thank you. That's a good answer to the question asked uh, in this session, what immediate steps should be taken. Uh, that gets us along the way, and I think very, very constructive uh, in this extremely important and difficult task. We're now at the day promised time for questions from all of you. Uh, if you could raise your hand, a microphone will be coming in direction. Please stand up, introduce yourself, and ask a question. Don't make, give an advertisement for your institution. I'm Atha Butambara from Zimbabwe. Uh, don't you think one of the problems we have is a... And who would you address your question to? To anyone in the panel, in particular, maybe the president of Mexico. Um, don't you think one of our challenges is a silo mentality where we address global challenges in isolation? We deal with climate change. We have another agenda on the financial global crisis, on poverty, on development, on nuclear weapons, on HIV AIDS. We need to address these matters in an integrated and holistic manner. Why? Because some nations are more concerned about development. They are more concerned about HIV AIDS. They are more concerned about poverty alleviation. So as you pursue the climate change agenda and you are quiet or rather not as vociferous on the issues that are affecting uh, other communities, you are ineffective. So the challenge we're, is we're how moving, do we... are moving to an editorial away from the question, but so, the key part of the question is it, there. Mr. President, okay, let me... It, Okay, but I wonder, what I want to emphasize is how do we unlock the linkages, unlock the interconnectedness between global challenges so that we can have a holistic and sustainable solution? Terrific question. Mr. President, Difficult maybe question. Ivo, you mentioned <laughs> what makes this so hard. We're beginning to get yeah. to some of the well, edge of uh, this. Let, let me try to answer in this way. The, fir the first time that I listened about uh, global warming was in the 70s, coming from my father. And he was uh, quoting... Uh, special research coming from the Club de Roma, Rome Club, or um, very famous research, I can't remember the name, but uh, our common future, or something like that. And they were talking about uh, smelting snow, they were talking about global warming and other stuff. But the point is this, uh, the main thesis of this research was that there are two gaps that are threatening the future of human being. And those two gaps are the gap between the main and environment, and the other one is the gap between the rich and the poor. And that's true. And the only way to overcome these challenges is to connect the solutions of both problems. And the way to do so is, again, to establish an economic system in which we can fix the environmental challenges, and at the same time, we can provide economic opportunities for poorest people in the world. Is that possible? Yes, that is possible. Why? Because one thing that we need to see is uh, uh, fighting climate change will require new kind of development. The low carbon path should be to be a new model of development in which we can provide new opportunities of job, new opportunities of growth, new opportunities of investment. And that is true. For instance, new industries, new industries will arise, new opportunities should come to poorest countries and people. We can create a lot of jobs associated with renewable energies, uh, preventing deforestation, reforestation projects. I was telling yesterday the the, the, the situation of Haiti. Of course, Mexico is collaborating a lot of countries with uh, this rescue operation, but in the midterm, what is going to happen with Haiti? One project could be to reforestate Haiti. We can create jobs for the poorest people. We can pay for the effort in order to reforest that island, which is the most deforestated in the Caribbean Sea. Uh, we can have uh, more jobs in the automotive industry. Low carbon path doesn't mean to disappear the automotive. It means to have electric vehicles more efficient with no or low carbon emissions. That, that's the idea. So the answer is we need to find out a way in order to fix poverty and to fix climate change at the same time. And that is possible. 
And finally, one way to do, to do so is, for instance, payment of environmental services. Uh, a program, for instance, in, in our country we have indigenous community are the owners of the woods and, and rainforest. And we are losing a lot of woods and rainforests in the last decades. Why? Because they have not means to survive. They have not income. So we are providing to them a payment month by month in order that their commitment is to preserve the wood and the rainforests. And in that way, they are getting a GGOF, they are coming out from the poverty, and we are preserving the air and the water that we need for the whole community. Excellent question to get us going. Over here on the left, all the way at the end on the left, if we could go all the way to the end on the left. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. I'm Buyelo Sonji, the Minister of Environment, South Africa. Just a comment first before I pose my question. Firstly, the targets taken by the developing countries must be understood in, their, in the proper context, which is common but differentiated. Uh, that principle underpins uh, the targets that we take as developing uh, countries. But we have committed as basic as part of the meeting in India. South Africa will be taking 34% uh, 2020, uh, moving away from business as usual. 42% 2025, on condition that finances and technology are made available. Because the reality of the situation is that we do not have the finances, we do not have the technology. It doesn't mean that as individ individual countries, we have no programs. There are programs, and indeed for business, there are opportunities in our countries because we, are, we have programs to deal with the effects of climate change. Uh, secondly, the question that I would have wanted to ask, there are two questions. Firstly, it's directed to Ivo. Ivo, would it be possible for you to speed up the process of transferring the political process into the formal process? Because really, we are all keen to see uh, Cancun succeeding. So we need to meet in the context or under the auspices of the UNFCCC. The question really would be directed to Mr. Maki relates to what is now, I think, is called the Boxer Kerry Bill. There is a perception that this bill is promoting protectionism. And I would like your comment on that. Thank you very much. Right, South Africa will be uh, hosting COP17 after Mexico. South Africa is the next host and has shown real leadership in all of this. Evo and then Ed. Evo, do you want to? I hope. Well, thank you. And thank you, Buyawa, for that question. Um, Yes, we do need to invigorate the process. Yes, we do need to speed it up. Yes, we will need additional meeting time in the course of this year on, on the road to Cancun. But additional meeting time in and of itself, as you know, is not enough. Um, the, 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 the president talked about having modest expectations for, uh, for Cancun. I think one of the things the community needs to do is get clear what those expectations are. What are we actually working towards and how are we going to use the meeting time, however much it may be, to get us effectively to that goal. So yes, we need more time, but we also need a clear target and a clear game plan. Great. Ed Markey, protectionism? Yeah, in the, in the legislation which uh, I am the author of uh, on the, in the House of Representatives and in the Senate legislation, uh, there are tens of billions of dollars for technology transfer uh, from the United States and other developed nations uh, to developing nations in the world. We understand that we have that responsibility uh, in the same way that tens of billions of dollars will be transferred to uh, developing nations for the protection of their rainforests. Uh, at the same time, um, we are trying to convince all of our industries uh, that there is a pathway from uh, today, the jobs of today, the industries of today, uh, to, and consumers of today in the United States uh, to the industries of tomorrow, uh, the consumers of tomorrow, the workers of tomorrow. And so to convince the steel industry, the cement industry, uh, aluminum industry, that they should move forward, what we're saying to them is that we're going to give them a long transition period, uh, but if there are countries in the world that try to exploit um, this incredible commitment that we are going to be willing to make to our uh, environmental uh, side uh, that uh, we are going to uh, ensure 
uh, that that kind of cooperation with the globe is not exploited in terms of the loss of jobs uh, in the United States. That said, uh, I think at the end of the day, we will never have any protectionism because I think the kinds of agreements that are going to be reached in Mexico uh, and subsequently uh, are going to ensure that there is transparency, uh, that there is uh, verification, uh, and that there is cooperation amongst the nations of the world uh, so that there never will be the implementation of protectionist nation, uh, measures by the United States or by any other developed country in the world. Great. Thank you. Excellent questions. Let me come over here. Give me a microphone here. I saw a hand over in this direction. I'm not seeing very well. Maybe we'll want to come back over here then. Come right down over here on the second row. Here it comes. There we are. Virgilio Viana from uh, Brazil, Amazonas uh, Sustainable Foundation. One of the concerns we have about the outcomes of Copenhagen was the loss of momentum. While there were expectations too high on one end, we also had a lot of people trying to do things and trying to get things done before Copenhagen. And there's sort of a feeling of a hangover. People are not engaged into these discussions. So one issue that I'd like to pose to all of you is to see what kinds of things that could be done to restore this drive. Um, I think Kaya made a very interesting suggestion of these uh, small meetings. And maybe President Calderon could take the lead of saying, let's get one achievement. And maybe the low hanging fruit could be red. Uh, and Mexico is a very important a country in terms of forests, and then we could have that done, not in the night of the last day uh, of the meeting in Cancun, but six months in advance. Why don't we change the pattern? So maybe that agreement on one or maybe other things before the meeting itself would be something that would generate, again, this momentum. So the question is, what are your thoughts on, on how to generate this, yeah. this momentum? Evo? Ed Markey talked about a bar stool. The, quest, the question is about a hangover. What do you do uh, about uh, the issue of expectations? How do you keep those at a reasonable uh, perspective, as the president suggested? Um, well, if I were facetious, which I'm not, I'd say the best thing to cure a hangover is to have another drink. Um, <laughs> And actually, I think that we do need to come back to the process. Uh, as the minister from South Africa was saying, we, we, we need to build up the frequency. We need to meet more often. And yes, I think we need, we need subsets of meetings, countries focusing on individual issues. I think trying to advance certain topics ahead of Cancun is also interesting, although, of course, you know that everything is related to everything else. But nonetheless, you can prepare uh, a number of, of decisions. I think what is really important... Uh, and President Calderon pointed to that at the beginning, is transparency and inclusiveness, that even though you may be meeting in, in small settings, and that is important, to always take the advance back to the larger con constituency and make sure that there is inclusiveness in that sense. Kaya, you know, a quick comment on expectations? Well, again, I think to really lend momentum, you, A, would have to expand quickly, and with leadership also now coming from Brazil, the red reduction in emissions from deforestation and degradation framework. Because beyond that, as I said before, it's also model that you could do in others. Pick some other sector where you have the same like-minded coalitions, bring money, performance, transparency together. Third, or C, the private-public partnership, that could happen. And the high panel that will be instituted should immediately get to work not only on how to mobilize money from fiscal coffers, but how to form these partnerships. Could I add just D very quickly? In the end, it will be a carbon price. Give us a carbon price, give us the incentives, the private sector will do the job. And that's why cap and trade and carbon markets are so important. A very important message the uh, high panel would send, may I suggest, President Calderon, is if the reform and the scaling up in future of the CDM mechanism was also in the agenda. Under contemplated or in execution uh, trading systems in different countries, part of the world, also the U.S., there are vast volumes expected from this offset trade. Even the U.S. contemplated bill has one gigaton that would come from international sources. You need to professionalize, to scale up, and to reform 
the CDM. That would be a very powerful message also to the private sector. Why? Otherwise, you have also fragmentation in the regulation. If the Australians move in one direction, US and others, let's avoid fragmentation, have some harmonization, and scale up to the volumes that we expect. Those would be my four suggestions. For everybody here, as we come to a close, uh, Kyle reminds us that uh, as the president is trying to pull together all of these very complicated political threads that have been mentioned today, there will be a number of extremely promising working groups working on RED, working on automobiles, working on finance, working on energy efficiency, working on renewables, working on cook stoves and black carbon. A number of these coming together largely built around private sector initiatives, trying to understand, as Evo would remind us, what rules have to be changed to allow progress to be made? What is that juncture between political people changing the rules, private sector bringing together their expertise, and stimulating the technology that has to be there? So there'll be uh, a series of these during 2010, which may be uh, the single most important contributors uh, to the success of what happens uh, in Mexico, what happens in Cancun toward the end of 2010. We have a couple of minutes. I'm going to leave this to you, Mr. President, for a final word. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, first point is uh, we need that energy. We need to create momentum again. And in order to do so, we need the support of civil society. We need the NGO efforts again for Cancun. And I, I, I share your feelings about Copenhagen. It was very disappointing in several fields. Actually, after the state dinner with the Queen, uh, at 11 o'clock, we went to this meeting in a very, very short room, and we were working until you know, 4 o'clock in the morning, and then again at 8 o'clock, and until 2 o'clock in the morning the day after. And what's and useful, more, most, more, most of that time. And we need to be prepared with very large anticipations. But we need the pressure, we need the opinion, and we need the energy of civil society. And finally, I thank you for this suggestion. I think in Mexico, a lot of projects could be offset Absolutely. the American industry, and uh, we'd be great for everyone. But fi uh, finally, I think it's, it's going to be very difficult. There are a lot of uh, problems to fix. There are different concerns of the, of the countries, mainly the economic cost of any measure, especially in developing countries. However, we need to work really hard. We have not more time to waste. We have not more time to, to, to work on this. And I don't want to see another COP without results, another COP with, without substantial results. Mexico will do our best, and I hope there will be new mechanism for the future of human being after our meeting. Great. Thank you, Mr. President. You've set uh, a record here. This panel on this difficult issue is, just like COP16 in Mexico, closing on time within the budget. And we thank you very much. Before thanking our panelists, let me remind everybody here that and ask you to remain seated for the presentation of the Global Statesmanship Award from the World Economic Forum. With that, please join me in thanking our, president, our panelists and wishing President Calderon every good bit of luck and goodwill as we move through to 2010. Thank you.